In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. Dear Heavenly Father, bestow your Spirit upon us today as we study John chapter 20, the chapter that recounts how Jesus Christ rose from the dead, how he walked through the the locked doors of the upper room and breathed the Holy Spirit upon his apostles and gave them the authority to forgive sins in his name. The chapter that recounts how Doubting Thomas, seven days later, encountered our Lord and confessed, my Lord and my God. Fill us with your spirit as we study this chapter so that we can understand how the risen Christ can transform and change our lives. We ask this through Christ our Lord, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, now we're in John chapter 20. And this is an important chapter to meditate on. There's a lot of themes that John uses from the Old Testament. And so I'll make a few references back to the Old Testament, just so you can kind of understand the context of chapter 20. So let us begin. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Now, the first thing I want to say about the resurrection is that no one witnesses the actual event of the resurrection. But Jesus, once he's risen, only appears to those who were committed disciples beforehand. And it tells you something. If our faith is a living encounter with Christ crucified and Christ risen, we must be committed disciples if we truly want to encounter and live out that same faith, knowing Jesus who's risen from the dead, encountering the cross and encountering our Lord who has truly risen from the dead. It tells you something about commitment and faith. And a lot of times people, if they're not committed and if they're not living a committed faith, they lack an understanding of the cross and they lack in understanding of the power of the risen Lord. And so I urge you to consider what what type of faith are you living? Is it truly a committed faith? Are you truly a disciple of Jesus? Are you truly dying to yourself? Well, begin to do that. Die to yourself, pick up your cross, follow him, and ask the Lord to help you to understand the glory and the power of his resurrection. And he will and he will. But first, you have to understand also the mystery of his cross. So the resurrection occurs early in the morning, and while it's still dark, and it reminds us of the creation. When God created, there was darkness, and he simply said, let there be light. The resurrection is the very beginning, the first fruit of the new creation, which will in all fullness be manifested when Jesus Christ returns in glory. And so in the very early morning, while it was still dark, she came and the stone had been taken away. She ran and she went to Simon Peter and to John, the other disciple whom Jesus loved. We know it's John referring to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And she said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Now, do you notice that initially there's confusion? Initially, Mary and the other disciples failed to understand that Jesus was risen. And this is important because many times in our own life, there is confusion. Many times in our own life, 
Even, uh, even if we are committed to following Christ, we fail to understand what Christ is trying to do in our own lives. And I share that with you because sometimes in your own life, you might find yourself at a place of confusion. You might even be able to take a step back and see, wow, I was confused. I failed to understand what God was doing in my life. Don't give up. Don't give up. Continue to discern. Continue to seek to understand the faith. And so there's confusion. Verse 3, Peter then came out with the other disciple, and they went towards the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying and the napkin which had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Now, this is very interesting. What's John trying to tell us here? Is John trying to tell us in a nice way that he outran Peter, that he was, you know, the younger disciple, he outran Peter, he beat him to the tomb? Not exactly. John is really telling us something about the role of St. Peter. John got to the tomb first, but he waited for Peter. He waited for Peter, the one that Jesus gave this authority to. I give you the keys to the kingdom. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew chapter 16, 13 through 19. He waited for Peter. If you go back to Luke chapter 22, verse 30 and 31, Jesus says, Satan has, has desired to sift all of you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Peter. Wow. He waited for Peter. And first, Peter entered, the leader of the church. And it was Peter who would be the first witness to go into the tomb and see it's empty. And then John would go in. And John would see and believe. And this is something important to, you know, to consider because so often we don't wait for Peter. You look at the church and the church will often say something like, abortion is wrong. Contraception is wrong. Euthanasia is wrong. The secular understanding of marriage is wrong. It's not according to God's plan. And what will people do? They will complain. They won't wait. They have no respect. They won't seek to understand and discern. And here's John waiting. He can kind of see in. He's, you know, discerning from afar the mystery of Jesus' resurrection. And he waits for Peter. And then after Peter has entered, then he goes in and he believes. That respect that we have for the teaching office of the church in this modern world has been in many ways lost and we need to recapture that and we need to take a step back and really look at the faith and discern the faith and read scripture and ask our Lord for the Holy Spirit so that we can understand, so that we don't commit the sin of pride. And so uh, verse 11, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. So here's Mary, Magdalene, outside, weeping. Still, she doesn't understand. And as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus was laid, 
one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Very interestingly, in the Old Testament, angels are often called men. And so some of the Gospels will say, say that men were seen or angels were seen. And each time it's very clear that we're talking about angels. You can go to Luke's Gospel and look at the resurrection in Luke's Gospel in Luke 24. And it's very clear the Gospel writers were talking about angels. Don't be confused by that. But Mary's at the tomb and she sees the angels. And so the angels said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to him, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Saying this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but did not know it was Jesus. This is important because the concept of turning and returning is a concept used in the Old Testament for repentance, turning to the Lord returning to the Lord. And here's Mary turning, and the first time she turns, she does not recognize Jesus. This happens to many people. There's a little turn in their life. They turn to God because of a problem, a death, a sickness. They've lost everything. But even though they turn, they don't necessarily recognize who Jesus is. We have to continue to turn sometimes. Don't just make it one turn. Oh, I lost everything and I turned to God and I didn't find anything and so I went back to the life I was living. Continue to turn to him and you will recognize him. So let's see what happened here. She turned around, she saw Jesus, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Notice he repeats the question of the angels. Whom do you seek? This is a very important question because Jesus asked this same question when they came to the garden to betray him. Who do you seek? Are you seeking Christ for the right reason? Are you authentically seeking our Lord? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Do you notice something? Mary recognized Jesus when she heard him call her by name. It's the second turn, the second time that she turned to Christ that she recognized Jesus. This is very important for a couple reasons, because there are many people who seek Christ, but they'll only turn to him once, and that's it. They give up. I didn't find anything. I went back to church. I went for a couple weeks, and that was it. And we have to talk to them. We have to say, look, look, you have to continue, you have to continue to turn to the Lord. And when you turn to the Lord, you must repent. And often when we turn to the Lord and repent, it's a process. We begin to find out things. We begin to discover pride, anger, selfishness greed, hatred, impatience, and so forth. As we continue to turn to Christ, we also discover what needs to change in our lives. Do not give up. Mary turned the second time. She heard the voice of the Lord. We have to listen to him. We have to be obedient to Christ. Once again, hearing is very closely tied to obedience, covenant obedience in the Old Testament, covenant 
faithfulness in the Old Testament. And the one who hears the voice of the Lord is one who wants to be obedient to Christ, one who wants to be faithful to Christ. And so she finally heard the Lord. It was Jesus who called her by name. And this is something that Jesus does. He calls each one of us by name to be his disciples. But we must turn and recognize his voice. And so, and so Mary did that. She first mistaked Jesus for being the gardener. She didn't recognize Christ. How many times have we failed to recognize Jesus? I remember one time I went to the church of Martin de Porres in Peru. If you've ever gone to the city of Lima, Peru, you can go to the church of Martin de Porres. And I, I, I walked through the church and I did not recognize where Martin de Porres was because I expected this massive, beautiful thing with big signs saying Martin de Porres lies here, his body lies here. And I walked in the church a couple times and walked out and walked in and it was, I didn't recognize where he was because I was not looking for the humble servant of our Lord, Martin de Porres, who was buried on a, and it had a little side altar. And a lot of times we look for Christ. We look for Christ, but we don't recognize Jesus because we're not searching for him correctly. We've got our own image of what he should be. We haven't humbled ourselves enough to really say, where are you, Lord? Help me to do your will. So we go on. Verse 17, Jesus said to her, Do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and said to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Th this verse is so important, verse 17. Why? Because... Mary was clinging to Jesus. She was holding on and clinging to Jesus. Well, if you go all the way back to Genesis, if you go to Genesis chapter 3, it talks about, in chapters 2 and 3, it talks about how a man would leave his father and mother and his wife would cling to him. And the church, as the bride of Christ, must cling to Christ. In faithfulness. Deuteronomy, when you go to the book of Deuteronomy, it uses the same language. It talks about how Israel should cling to the Lord. Well, did they cling to the Lord? Many times not. And we must cling to the Lord in the sense that we are faithful to our Lord, that we walk with our Lord, that we are, are obedient to our Lord. We must cling to the Lord in faithfulness. But in this moment, Jesus tells Mary, don't cling to me. I must ascend to the Father. Why does he say this? Because he must ascend to the Father and send the Holy Spirit. And when we receive the Spirit, then we will cling to the Lord. It's telling me and you something about the Holy Spirit. If I want to cling to the Lord, and if you want to cling to the Lord, we must have the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Otherwise, we won't cling to the Lord properly. And so going on from there, verse number 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now let's talk about this. It's the evening of the first day of the week. What day did the resurrection occur on? 
The resurrection occurred on the first day of the week. It reminds us of God's creation. And why is that important? Because the resurrection is the very first fruit of the new creation. Secondly, the resurrection occurred on the third day from the day that Jesus was crucified. The first day, the third day, and it also occurred on the eighth day. The eighth day from the day that he triumphantly entered on Palm Sunday, what we call Palm Sunday today. Why is that important? Because the number eight in the Old Testament was a number that represented that God was doing a new work, a new beginning. And if you look back, a child was circumcised on the eighth day. They became part of the family of Israel on the eighth day. There were eight people in the ark, which became part of the new creation from those eight people. And so again and again, we see the number eight being emphasized. Lepers that were cleansed were inspected, and they went through this process of being inspected once, and then seven days later being inspected. They offered a sacrifice, they shaved, they bathed, and then they were able to come back into the community on the eighth day when God began something new in their life. And it's fitting that the resurrection happens on the first day of the week, creation. The third day of the week from his suffering and death and crucifixion. And the eighth day, if you go back to Palm Sunday. And so, Jesus walks through the doors. The disciples are afraid. They have fear. They still haven't received the Holy Spirit. And he walks through the doors and he shows them his hands and his side. He shows them that it is he, the Lord, who is risen. And he breathes on them. Why does he breathe on them? If you go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 through 7, you'll see that God formed Adam out of the clay of the earth. And he breathed on Adam. And he gave Adam the gift of his life breath. The life breath is a special word in Hebrew. And if you go to Psalm number 50, verse 6, the very last verse of the Psalter, it says, let everything that has the life breath praise God. Let everything that has the breath of life, hallelujah, praise God. It's emphasizing the importance of the breath of life or the life breath that we've received from God from the very beginning. And so God breathed on Adam and gave him the life breath or the breath of life. And Adam became a living being. However, Here's the point. In John's gospel, Jesus doesn't give the life breath again. He gives the Holy Spirit. And this is the key, that each one of us must receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we must walk and live in the Holy Spirit every day of our lives. He breathes on his apostles, his disciples, and he gives them the breath of life. And he says, the sins that you forgive will be forgiven. The sins that you hold, that you hold bound will be held bound. Why does he do this? He gives them the ability to forgive sins in his name. Verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin was not with them. When Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, in his hands the print of the nails, and place my fingers in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Now, Thomas is kind of raising the bar right here. Thomas is basically saying, I need proof. I want proof. Well, my brothers and sisters, the Israelites had a lot of proof in the Old Testament when they came out of Egypt. They had 
miracles, signs, and wonders that God worked. And all those miracles that they saw meant nothing if there was not conversion. Do you want proof? You could have all the proof in the world, but if there's not true conversion, nothing will happen in your life. And this is, this is something so important for us to consider. Jesus worked many miracles, but it wasn't miracles in themselves that brought conversion. We have to acknowledge that we've sinned. We have to acknowledge that we, are re that we need forgiveness. We have to acknowledge that only Christ can forgive us. And so Thomas is asking for proof. But notice how patient our Lord is with him. I love the patience of Jesus when he's risen from the dead. He's not angry with Thomas. And so let's go on to verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Do you notice that Jesus, after he's rose and risen from the dead, he says, peace be with you to his disciples. How many times? Three times. Three times. And this is very important because, you know, we, we often don't understand the importance of the word peace. A lot of times at Mass, during the sign of peace, people turn around, peace be with you, peace be with you, peace, 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 and all peace, 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 peace. Well, guess what? It's not exactly what Jesus meant. For the Hebrew mind, the concept of peace was complete restoration of God's order. In other words, peace only happens when God has restored everything according to his plan. It's more than an absence of war. It's more than just sitting down on the beach and having you know, a nice drink of your tea and watching the sunset go down or something like that. That's not what Jesus means when he's talking about peace. He has just suffered and died for our sins and risen from the dead. He has restored all things. And now he can say, peace be with you. And peace only happens in my life and in your life when there is forgiveness. When there is forgiveness. When my sins are forgiven, there is peace between me and God and my brother and sister. And that's why if there's no forgiveness, there's no peace. And if you're in a state of grave sin or away from our Lord, you might even notice in your life that, wow, when I lived like that years ago, there was no peace in my life. Peace be with you. Restoration of God's order. Forgiveness of sin. And it's only when our sins are forgiven that there's peace between us and the Father. And so don't take those words lightly, my brothers and sisters. Then he said to Thomas, after saying, peace be with you, Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Well, the first thing I want to say here is, I love the patience that Jesus has with Thomas. And I love this because we need to have the same patience with many others that we encounter in this world like Thomas. Many others we encounter who don't have faith. We need to have the same patience, my brothers and sisters. Secondly, Thomas gives us the shortest creed if anybody comes up to you and says, who is Jesus? All you have to say to them is, my Lord and my God. And you don't have to add anything else. Next time somebody comes knocking on your door and says, who is Jesus? Just say, let me tell you who Jesus is. My Lord and my God. That sums it all up. 
And as I said earlier, John loves to go back to the beginning of his gospel and show how a theme in the beginning of his gospel reaches completion or a climax in the end of the gospel. And in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, Jesus Christ, the eternal Word. And then going down to John chapter 1, verse 14, and the Word became flesh. And here we are, after going through the whole gospel, Thomas sums it all up. Who is the Word? My Lord and my God. One important note about Thomas is this. It's often forgotten that the disciples went out, the apostles went out to evangelize. Thomas went the farthest. He went to India. When the Portuguese in the 1500s were sailing around the world and sharing the gospel, they came to the southern part of India and amazingly found that churches were already there. And the people said, Thomas beat you here. 1500 years earlier, he was here preaching. How do you like that? And it's believed that Thomas even went close to the border of China. So here's this man who doubted. And he went the farthest in distance to share the gospel. And it tells you and me something. Because we might be able to look at our own life. We might be able to look at the mistakes that we've made in our life. The times that we failed to believe. And we can do the same thing. Go the farthest distance possible for Christ now that you do believe. And every time you encounter a moment of difficulty or doubt, just look to our Lord and say, My Lord and my God, renew my faith. And he will. And so Jesus said these words, verse 29, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. He talks about us. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And I love how John sums it all up. All that he's written is that is for us so that we may believe as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, dear Heavenly Father, We give you thanks and praise that our Lord, risen from the dead, was so patient with his disciples that he helped them to believe in his resurrection. Help us, Lord, to also recognize that you have demonstrated the same patience with each of us, even when we have been in moments of doubt. We ask all this through Christ our Lord, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.